Even when you're testing one variable at a time, you probably can't test everything that people can throw at that variable. And even if you could test each individual variable completely, the program doesn't operate on just one variable at a time. It works with a bunch. Here's an example that took me by surprise. My staff and I tested a program extensively for printer compatibility. We also tested for compatibility with different video cards. We also tested print preview quite often. What we failed to test was a combination. High resolution printing with high resolution video with print preview. But our customers ran that and what happened was when they did that, the system crashed. Combination testing is about testing variables together. Let's imagine testing three variables. We'll call them V1, V2, and V3. Let's suppose that V1 has N1 possible values. V2 has N2, and V3 has N3 possible values. The total number of combination tests of V1, V2, and V3 is N1 times N2 times N3. When we test combinations of things that make up the environment of the program, for example, combinations of devices, versions of system software, and communications with different types of servers, we call that kind of combination testing configuration testing. So if we test 40 printers and 20 video cards, there are going to be 40 times 20 equals 800 configurations. What if we also test how much available memory there is? Let's suppose we have two levels of memory, barely enough and lots. Now we have 40 times 20 times 2 equals 1,600 configurations to test. As you consider more variables and test them together, the total number of tests gets very large very quickly. Configuration testing is just one example of combination testing. Other combinations involve data. I worked with a word processor once that had a memory leak. If you tested some text and made it bold, then italic, everything worked fine. But if you made it italic first, then bold, the appearance on the screen was the same, but memory got corrupted. Combination errors can be very surprising and seem completely unreasonable. Let's go back to Hoffman's square root test. He tested it on one function. It accepted two to the 32 inputs. So why don't we think about testing formulas? We'll start with a really simple one. The square root of one number times the square root of another number. Two to the 32 possible values times two to the 32 possible values. It's a lot of tests. Now imagine testing a calculator. How many formulas could you create with a calculator? How many values could you input into those formulas? It's an impossible number to even think about. Other combinations of data can yield divide by zero, overflow, or serious rounding errors. In terms of overflow, the slide gives an example of a complex travel plan that overflowed the output fields on an airline ticket, creating a big tie-up at the airport ticket counter. Combinations come everywhere with computing, and if they're not well tested, they're going to create messes in the field. There are combination testing techniques that optimize sampling so that you can run a small set of tests and have a good chance of finding most or all of the combination related errors. With the 1600 tests of printers, with video cards, with memory configurations, a common sampling heuristic called all pairs would have yielded 80 tests. We'll discuss all pairs in more detail in the test design course, but for now understand that the 80 tests probably would find most of the bugs but the remaining 1,520 tests are distinct. The sampling could easily miss a failure that occurs only on a low memory system with this particular printer and that particular video card. Our next challenge involves errors that occur in time when the program does this after that. Let me introduce some vocabulary. When I speak of a path, I mean a sequence of steps in a program that run from the program's start to the program's end. I say subpath to refer to shorter sequences. Many other people would use the word path more generally to mean either a full path or a subpath. I'm going to draw paths using flowcharts. Flowcharts are out of fashion at the moment, but I know many testers who find them easier to read, so I use them here. In a flowchart, we show a branch with a diamond shape. Here, we branch from A to B or from A to C. Flow graphs are more fashionable today. To turn our diagrams into flow graphs, just replace all the diamonds and boxes with circles. So here's a nice little program. What would it take to test it? We can test all the statements and all the branches with two tests. One takes us from A to B to C to D to F to G. The other takes us from A to B to D to E to G. So this is complete branch coverage. Is it enough? Simple path models like branch coverage ignore the program's data. If a data value doesn't cause a branch, to these models, it's irrelevant. But programs use data. They do things with data. So the value of the data is not irrelevant. It's important. People who think data is important often work with data flow diagrams. These show when the program assigns a value to a variable and when the value of that variable is used. 
I can't draw traditional data flow diagrams in this course. We don't have enough time. But the chart on this slide shows data flows. Look at step A. The program sets x to 5. Then the program uses x at step G. I'm going to suppose we print the value of x at G. That way we can ask, what value does it print? When we set a value at A and use it at G, A and G form a set use pair. Similarly, when we set x to 7 at C and use it at G, CG is a set use pair. And finally, our third set use pair on this diagram is EG. In the test that we show on this diagram, the set use pair that's active is CG. We set x to 5 at A, but we reset it to 7 at C. When we print x at G, we print a 7. In the second test, EG is a set use pair. Between these two tests, we get complete branch coverage. But we don't have a test for the AG set use pair. For that third set use pair, we need a third test. In the example so far, G has done something very simple with X. What if G did something more complicated, like dividing some other number by X? In that case, the specific value of X would be very important. Whenever you test a variable, it's important to ask how the program will use the value of that variable. We want to test the variable with different values to best test the different uses. Testing for consequences, testing in a way that considers what the program does with a variable whenever you set the value of that variable. Testing for consequences is one of the things that sets skilled testers apart from juniors. Now let's look at our next example for testing sequences. This is a famous example from Glenn Meyer's book. We start the program at A, and all the branches lead to X. At X, we either loop back to A, or we exit. If we reach X for the 20th time, we always exit. Let's take a look at the paths through this program. One of them goes from A to B to X. Another path goes from A to C to D to F to X. Then there's A to C to D to G to X. And A to C to E to H to X. Or from A to C to E to I to X. So there are five ways to get from A to X. If we assume that we exit as soon as we reach X, if we only go through this loop once, we have five paths. But you don't have to exit the first time you hit X. You can go back to A, and then come back to X up to 20 times. Here we see a path that goes from A to C to E to H to X, and then back to A, and then to B to X and to the exit. This is one of 25 paths in which we exit the second time we hit X. We can count up the possible paths using the combination rule that we studied a few slides ago. Imagine a variable v1 which holds the path from a to x. v1 has five possible values. Now imagine v2. It holds the path from a to x the second time through the loop. That has five values too. We have 20 v's because we can go through the loop up to 20 times. The n for each v is 5. v1 has n1 equals 5 paths. v2 has n2 equals 5 paths, and so on. If we go through the loop just once, we have five paths. If we go through the loop twice, we have n1 times n2. Five times five equals 25 paths. If we go through three times, there are n1 times n2 times n3 paths. That's about 100 trillion paths. And this is a trivially simple program with one entry, one exit, and only one loop. Imagine the number of paths through a word processor or a telephone system. Obviously, you can't test all these paths. Some people would test only six paths. Try each of the five ways to get from A to X, then add a case that gets to X 20 times and exit automatically. That covers every line, every branch, and every simple subpath through the program. But is it enough testing? Imagine what would happen if we had a memory leak at F. If we go through F 10 times, the program crashes out of memory. Unless we're testing with a memory meter, we're not going to notice that bug unless we pass through F 10 times. Any path that doesn't go through F 10 times is going to miss the bug. If you didn't suspect a memory leak, how many tests do you think you'd have to run before you stumbled across one that passed through F10 times and crashed your system? Now let's make the test more extreme. I'm going to put a garbage collector in B. If you ever pass through B, the garbage collector checks for unused memory and gives it back to the operating system. This clears up any memory hogged by F. So now the program will crash out of memory only if we pass through F10 times after the last time we pass through B. Only a very small percentage of the 100 trillion tests that we could run are going to expose this bug. Now let's go a step further. Suppose B is the most common choice from A, and suppose F doesn't happen very often in normal use. 10 Fs in a row is going to be rare. 10 Fs in a row after B? Even rarer. Do you think you would ever create a test that repeated F 10 times without passing B?